Hey there. In this clip, I want to introduce you to a very valuable extension or enhancement to the entity relationship model as we have discussed it heretofore. And that extension or enhancement is called, cleverly enough, the extended or enhanced entity relationship model. Okay. So before we dive into the particulars, let's talk about, uh, for instance, where you may have uh, benefited from the EER model without even directly have, having known about, known about it. In your projects, you may have come up against a situation uh, similar to the following. Okay, so say you've got a, um, a products entity and it's products that you're selling and you're selling a wide variety of products. And so you start with the, uh, the attributes that the products might have, you know, a stock keeping unit number and a manufacturer's number and a location in the warehouse and a price and a name and a description and so on and so forth. And that list goes on. But what you realize is you continue to tease out all of the attributes necessary for the products you plan to sell, that there are groups and they sort of hang together that have attributes that pertain to them that don't necessarily pertain to the other products. So you have, say, clothing. And clothing has attributes including size and color that don't necessarily pertain to the other products that you sell. Similarly, let's say, I don't know, furniture. Why not? Furniture has um, wood finish. You know, is it maple? Is it oak? Is it cherry? Is it birch? And do they sell furniture in birch? I don't know. Wood finish and a uh, knob type. Say you're selling uh, buffets and whatnot. And the knob type, is it a brass pull? Is it a wooden pull? Is it a glass knob, etc. And knob type does not pertain to clothing or many of the other things. And so you have these categories and there could be numerous others of them. And what you find is when you get done with all the attributes, there's this huge long laundry list of attributes for products. And most of the time, for most of the records, most of that at those attributes are going to be null because if one category, if one set pertains, i.e., if the you know if the if the clothing attributes pertain, then the furniture attributes don't. And so that's the context that you probably are most familiar with for understanding the potential benefit of the extended entity relationship model. Now, what does the model involve? It involves the process of generalization slash specialization. And more or less, generalization and specialization are the same exact process done in different order. So generalization is from bottom up and specialization, as you might anticipate, is top down. They are this process of generalizing and specializing is enabled by inheritance. And inheritance is very useful and important in object oriented programming. And really the whole notion of generalization and specialization in the entity relationship model came about as a result of object oriented analysis and UML, um, as well as semantic modeling and just trying to model the sorts of problems that we face. But you may be familiar with generalization, specialization, inheritance from your programming background. But if you have no programming background whatsoever, it doesn't make any different. It's a little bit different in data modeling anyway. And you do not need that to understand what we are up against at all. But basically, it's saying that there are some attributes that are universal to all products. And then there are some attributes that are specialized according to subcategories of products, right? That's, that's the basic deal. Um, if you think about what we've learned with entity relationship diagrams so far, there's no mechanism for modeling that. Okay, so next up, let's take a look at how we represent these ideas in the extended ER model. 
Okay, let's talk about another example of this sort of relationship that the EER allows us to handle. And this one even further illustrates the value and the jam that you can be in without EER. Okay, so let's look at, okay, so we got a, a personnel database. So we're doing, dealing with employees, All right? Pretty standard. And employees have uh, employee ID and name and salary and date of hire and date of birth and gender address and so forth it doesn't matter what kind of employee you are you have all of those things but there are also categories of employees let's say there are the dreaded or respected depending on your perspective there's an engineer and engineers all have the type of engineer they are whether they are mechanical or electrical or chemical or material scientists or industrial engineers and what have you okay uh, and we could have uh, programmers all right programmers and they can be a class of employee and they can have languages that they are proficient in uh, let's not underline that that is not in any way shape or form a key they can have they can be good in Python Java C C sharp C plus plus etc etc okay and then finally let's have uh, admins and they can do they can have uh, typing speed although that really is not something that people it's a little old-fashioned but nevertheless it, it illustrates a point and uh, let's say MS apps not Microsoft, of course, because hopefully we're using uh, Open Office or uh, something. But let's face it, we're not. We're using Microsoft. So some of them are going to Excel, some at PowerPoint, and so forth. Okay, so that will that will enable us to make our point. Okay, and so we've got the general category of employee, and then we've got each of these more specific categories. Each one with attributes that pertain to it but that don't pertain to the other specialized categories, okay? So it's possible, and this is where the EER becomes really important, it's possible, although I don't have a lot of room to illustrate it, that engineers you know, can participate in relationships that none of the other categories do. So we could say engineers design um, whatever machinery or buildings or something and that's not something that programmers are going to do that's not something that admins are going to do that's not not something that any other category of employees going to do that is a further illustration of the potential value of this generalization specialization relationship okay so but we'll, we'll get to that in a moment we're getting a little ahead of ourselves there let's talk about the mechanism we use to illustrate or to represent on our ER diagram uh, this sort of specialization. So we draw a line, circle, and then lines connecting each of the specialized categories. Line should be straight, line is going to arc somewhat. And then pointing in the direction of the superclass or the general class. We do these little funky U shapes like that. So the U points at the superclass, the one that everybody belongs to, more on that in a moment, and the U represents union because this superclass is a union of all of these subclasses. Another way of saying that, extremely important, membership in the subclass alone is not enough for a valid superclass, subclass, generalization, specialization relationship. In other words, still, all engineers have to be employees. Makes sense, right? It's kind of common sense. So all of the superclass, of the subclasses, of the specialized 
entities need to belong to the superclass. If that doesn't work, then you've got uh, uh, something that is not valid on your hands, right? So all engineers are employees, all programmers are employees, all admins are employees. And another sort of terminology for this is that this is an is a relationship, right? So an admin is a employee, or in this case is an. An admin is an employee, a programmer is an employee, an engineer is an employee. Uh, we'll put the N in parens there. Okay, so that's the basic representation. Let's talk about the constraints. So we know in our regular entity relationship diagram, our constraints were participation, right, and cardinality. And we're not going to review them. You've got them down cold by this point, right? If you don't, feel free to review them independently. But we have similar questions to ask ourselves in this generalization specialization arrangement. We know that all of the subclasses have to belong to the superclass. Right? We can't have any non-employee programmers. That doesn't make any sense. However, we can ask a related question. And that related question is, can there be employees who do not participate in a specialized class? Can there be employees who aren't engineers, aren't programmers, and aren't admins? Can we have employees who have no specialization represented? And the answer here is probably yes. Yes, you can, right? Uh, if that were impossible, then we would represent this line as doubled kind of evoking the same representation as we would for participation. Doubling this line says there can be no employee who does not have one at least specialization. But I would say that is not true. We've got facilities people, security people, uh, accountants, uh, customer service representatives. We've got tons of people who do not belong to one of these three specializations. So we keep this line here uh, single to denote that participation in the specializations is optional, okay? Now, just to show you that there would be, I'm going to erase if I can. Okay, so an example of where the superclass would have to participate in the subclasses. So we got employees and we're representing them according to their compensation structure. So we've got employees that are salaried, employees that are hourly, and we got employees that are commissioned. And we would say this is is doubled. Let me let me do a better job. Let me do a better job representing that. Okay. So we got this is doubled. We got commission. So this is doubled to say, if you're an employee, you have got to be one of these things. There are no employees that aren't one of these things. Okay, so we would double this line. Okay, make sense? So that's one of our constraints and that sort of takes care of participation sort of concerns. Although there's no exact analog to cardinality. Okay, so this is single here because we can have employees that aren't these. There's another question though. Is it possible for a member of the superclass employee to belong to multiple specializations? If so, we would represent in this circle an O for overlap. Or a D for disjoint. Okay, we could also make this a D. Again, my drawings are ugly, I know. Hopefully the point gets across. It doesn't have to be pretty. If this is a D, it implies that while this line says you don't have to be one, this D says that you cannot be more than one specialization. 
So there are no employees ever, by definition, that are both engineers and admins, or admins and programmers, or programmers and engineers. That is not allowed. That's what this D says. However, I would argue that it's certainly possible for certain employees to be both an engineer and a programmer. You know, why not? That's perfectly reasonable. And so, I would maintain that this one is overlapping. Here, this one, although the circle is not large enough to fit it in, is probably disjoint because it's not possible to be both salary and hourly or salary and commission. Although, honestly, you know, there are certainly in sales driven organizations, there are, there are salespersons who draw a base salary and then have commission. So maybe this one is actually overlap. But you could imagine circumstances where this makes sense. You're either straight commission, paid by the hour, or you draw a salary. You cannot do multiples of those things. So there's a basic introduction to the utility of the enhanced ER model, the basics of how to represent that model in an ER diagram, and a quick primer on the two constraints that matter when representing the relationship that this model involves. In a next video, we will talk in a little bit further detail about the, the process by which you come to realize that you need generalization specialization. And then in a follow on to that, uh, a critical lesson on say, okay, I understand what ER, what EER involves. I understand the utility. I got the model down. I've got the representation in my diagram. Now what? What does it mean for me in terms of the options that avail in translating this to a relational schema and on to a set of tables implemented in an RDBMS? Uh, there are, you know, if you don't, if you don't take it to the whole and actually get an implication for your table structure, then it's all for naught. And so we will cover that in a subsequent video. Uh, in the interim, study hard, and I will see you online.